Welcome everyone. I'm Thomas Pogge, the director of the Yale Global Justice Program, one of the sponsoring organizations of this event alongside the Yale Winter Fellowship in Journalism, which has been supporting the visit to Yale this semester of our moderator Khadija Sharife as a Pointer Fellow. Based in South Africa, Khadija Sharif is an award-winning investigative journalist and senior editor for Africa at Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project. Sharif is the former director of the Platform for the Protection of Whistleblowers, PPLAAF, and currently also a board member of Finance Uncovered. She has worked with forums, including the Pan-African Parliament, the African Union, the OECD, and the UN Environmental Program. Her work is focused on illicit financial flows, natural resources, and political economy. She is the author of Texas, If You Can, Africa. So today we're introducing Brian Christie. He's a former Washington-based lawyer who ended up becoming, uh, actually creating and then becoming the head of the Special Investigations Unit at National Geographic Magazine. And then he was the Nat Geo Society's Explorer of the Year. Um, until I started reading Brian Christie's work in National Geographic Magazine, uh, the magazine framed investigations in a much more passive uh, and reductive way, and he brought this to life with the kind of storytelling that you'd usually only find in a book uh, by John Le Carre or these other amazing writers. And so he kind of brought in the reality of what was happening in the, the wildlife and environmental crimes uh, uh, sector to the public in a compelling way. Um, and he did this also with his nonfiction book called The Lizard King. Some of us might recall his work exposing reptile slaughterhouses in Indonesia and, and the global interconnections or the story of Anson Wong, who was the Pablo Escobar of the wildlife world. He's just published a, his first fiction novel called In the Company of Killers, which in many ways is the distillation of his environmental investigative work, which he left National Geographic to do. And while he's changed laws from Malaysia to the United States, briefed the Senate, um, what makes his work so different is the use of innovation like GPS tools um, in, in fabricated ivory horns, uh, empathy and storytelling, both of his uh, so-called victims and the villains, just to bring that world to life, which then conscientize people. You know, he, he doesn't pull back in some of his interviews, you hear him describing the pain of a baby rhino who comes running to its mother when her horn is being hacked and she begins keening. Um, and that uh, uh, rhino horn actually has a higher street value than cocaine. Um, and the baby's horn might be hacked off too. So bringing in that pain and passion and empathy is what has made his work so special to investigative journalists like myself. And it connects with that vast system of criminality that's woven into the world we inhabit, not a separate one, not something that takes place elsewhere. So if we look at uh, fancy things like a Birkin bag, you know, made from crocodile skin or a, a guitar from endangered rosewood or a western zoo that entertains rich people whether in you know the US or Dubai but actually sources environmental uh, uh, systems and wildlife from cartels his work in confronting that two trillion dollar environmental criminal industry shows how crime feeds into legal and financial secrecy shows how wildlife uh, poaching can happen at, uh, in private property for example in South Africa over 30 wildlife species have now been amended to become animals that can be farmed or where Western institutions just neatly source endangered species from these systems, uh, which is camouflaged as a corporate company or as a legitimate business institute. So in exposing that technically legal side of the world, he's also then looked at the barter trade system where cartels move ivory and rhino horn, for example, as a means of acquiring arms. You see a dictatorship in, in Gambia under Jame selling arms to Sudan, who then trades it for ivory from West African militia, and ultimately the buyer's market is Asia or elsewhere. But because of uh, lax regulation, gaps and cracks in legislation, and the absence of policing that's interconnected, for example, the financial model that fuels this industry is really focused on because banks don't often report STRs to finance intelligence units. So it often just comes down to the crime of killing. Um, but 
whatever story he wrote about what kept us uh, as readers going was that he had the pen of a writer and he could bring that abstract world to life for us. So um, the first question I guess I want to ask him is about his book In the Company of Killers and all of the actors and the journey towards it. South Africa, of course, features the media intelligence agencies. Brian, how did you come to write that book? And was this book actually the way into your world of writing into Nat uh, Nacho? Thank you both. Uh, Khadija, thank you for that extraordinary introduction. I, I really appreciate it. Um, the book uh, is a novel and it it's represents my jump from, from these hard hitting uh, single issue in, uh, criminal investigations to, to something that was evolving for me as I did investigations for National Geographic. Over time, they began as species focused uh, investigation. So my first project was to look at Anson Wong, who trafficked live animals, everything focusing on reptiles, but everything from rhino horn and, and elephant ivory and uh, snow leopard pelts and panda bear skins and uh, Strix's macaw. Um, and uh, as I moved to elephants and rhinos and things, I realized that these animal stories were uh, often stories of poverty and corruption and bigger, much bigger uh, criminal enterprises than I could fit on a page. And they were also, um, it wasn't fair to just focus on the animal. It wasn't fair to the communities. It wasn't fair um, uh, to the broader populations. And the novel for me has always been a sort of touchstone. I've, uh, I've always intended to go uh, back to fiction after journalism, and it seems like the right time to use um, a vehicle that can reach these big, broad uh, criminal enterprises that are not necessarily connected um, in a way that I can put into a magazine story. They're not. Um, I, I, I got tired of the criminals being able to define what stories I was telling because you know, they're operating a poaching operation, but they're benefiting from uh, a corrupt government official who, who doesn't have a direct financial link to them. Uh, I wanna get both of them in my stories. And so uh, I, I turned to fiction finally, and that's in the Company of Killers is the story of Tom Clay, who's an investigative journalist with uh, an international magazine called The Sovereign. And Clay's job is to go around the world and hunt down wildlife traffickers and bring them to the page. Uh, he has a second identity as a CIA asset. And the deal, the devil's bargain up with the CIA early in his life was he'll bring them back some information that he picks up in the field and they'll provide him the intelligence that lets him tell award-winning stories. Uh, but, but Clay is on an anti-poaching operation in Kenya when his best friend is murdered and CIA offers Clay an opportunity to go to South Africa and hunt down the guy responsible. And um, what Clay discovers, he takes that bargain too. And what he discovers is that's not what's really been going on. His stories have been part of something for much longer than he realized that the devil's bargain he made was truly a devil's bargain. And his true enemy is much, much closer to home than he ever realized. And that, that framework lets me um, interrogate a lot of the issues that I, I found important in my career as a journalist. Right. Um, so you, you've mentioned South Africa, and I know that you've extensively covered the, the rhino horn um, situation, you know, banned in 1977 by CITES, uh, the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species. And South Africa had a very particular conservation policy that fit very well into the framework of capitalism, the species must pay to stay uh, with a massive lack of uh, resourcing for policing uh, and for the intersection between the illicit financial flow and the trade in, in rhino horns. So I, I have a few questions for you. In some of your previous stories, um, you've mentioned, you, you've dived into how people like Darby Krunewald, um, you know, these poachers, might kill animals that are on their own properties and that's considered private property and it's fine to do, um, that there are people who are banking on horn like John Hume, 
um, because they believe that at some point, either South Africa as a developing economy or global pressure is going to allow this to become a technically legal system. Uh, you've discussed how Sand Parks and Kruger National Park has traded uh, rhinos and you know the value of the rhino is determined per inch of the horn and it goes to guys like Russian billionaire Rashid Sadorov who are renowned as notorious poachers. You've discussed the Trump kids coming down and, and poaching animals. Tell me about how the, the commodification of wildlife as farm animals um, uh, or, or for their parts fits into a system of political corruption where that political umbrella or sovereignty can be bartered for protection, where corporate capital plays a role and how basically private property has fit into a kind of a conservation model that has race and class and um, just uh, the, you know, the power of the wallet interwoven into it. Because I'm, I'm really interested in South Africa's unique difference from the, the, the global situation and whether it's better or worse or how it could be better or worse. Well, I was astounded um, on, on my arrival in South Africa, looking into the, the rhino horn issue specifically, just how commodified um, uh, wildlife is there. Um, the president of South Africa has made quite a bit of money on um, um, breeding uh, game animals and uh, it extends all the way, all through the country. Um, in the rhino circumstance, John Hume, as you mentioned, was the largest rhino uh, farmer in the world. And it really is farming. Um, they were making the argument that, that we, are, um, we are the rhino's best hope. But when you visit his property, the rhino, which um, generally require uh, huge uh, expanses of uh, free area to roam were housed like dairy cattle and were kind of socialized to behave like cattle. Um, but and it's uh, very much a different, almost a different species to be taken out of an ecosystem and and housed that way. So they weren't part of an, a functioning ecosystem. And that uh, commodification of wildlife uh, takes place. You're absolutely right across South Africa, across. Uh, uh, the number of species uh, I went to, um, uh, one of the things I didn't do but really wanted to do was go to the game auctions. And if someone is interested in pursuing uh, this aspect of, of, of commodification of wildlife, the, South Africa is one of the best places in the world to explore it. And I would go to, you can get these game catalogs that are like the auction catalogs for Sotheby's or Christie's, but they're, they're while they're uh, largely trophy animals that are bred to be shot. Uh, and it would be a fascinating project. Um, and you're absolutely right that in the, the rhino story that we did, Brent Sturton was a photographer on it with me and we had a huge team behind us at Geographic. Um, it was extraordinary to me the way that they played the environmental minister, they played the prosecutors, they played judges, they, um, they had straw men um, challenging the constitutionality of uh, restrictions on rhino horn trade that they were actually funding, um, even while they were being prosecuted under the crimes that they were trying to say were unconstitutional. It was as uh, condensed a, an illicit uh, network with with huge amounts of money and you know and Hume gets a lot of there have been just as many reports on Hume as the the face of uh, saving the rhino it's certainly his position um, and even though he was very clear in conversations with me that that he'd be happy to have uh, his rhino horn smuggled out and that um, even though there was no demand for rhino horn in the country of South Africa um, he was happy to have the ban on domestic trade lifted because he knew that that uh, Vietnamese was a particular Vietnam was a particular consumer country, uh, but but Asia in general would be smuggling the the rhino horn out, and that was part of the acceptable model under under his team's strategy. So um, 
Yeah. Yeah, I can go on. You know, um, uh, during an OCCRP story, uh, we were looking at Sand Park, the South African National Park, trading these um, rhinos, and we found that about 130 of 260 rhinos sold by the park in a four-year period died so-called during the relocation process, and then they were replaced by the park. And a lot of the buyers were people who were proxies, as you've often written about, uh, using shell companies with areas that were too small to actually house the rhinos, and then they end up uh, being sent elsewhere. So it seems like even if a country lifts a ban and makes it technically legal within that country, it fuels the illegal trade and criminality elsewhere. And that just might actually make the wild rhino cheaper to poach, right? Because if you have to pay a proper price for a rhino horn that's farmed and it's a stabilized price, as it would be with a diamond monopoly, you know, they create a monopoly over the pricing, they control the pricing. At the end of the day, wouldn't it be cheaper also when that industry domino effects, the black market might end up being cheaper than the rhino that's farmed? Is that a possibility? Given that you can hire some Frilimo guys from Mozambique, cross over into South Africa, which has a massive rhino um, population because of conservation policies, and then kill the rhino and sell it. Would it have the snowball effect? Do you think? Absolutely. I mean, what these it becomes a laundry opportunity. So you legalize the trade in the horn. You make very, very little uh, effort to secure the pipeline. So um, these guys are very, all concerned about spending money to create a rhino horn market, but they're not putting any effort into policing that on the supply side, on the transit or on the consumption side in particular. And so absolutely, what you, what you create is they get their money, they'll sell theirs, yeah. um, but um, you know, a live rhino is very expensive to house and raise and a bullet yeah. costs $10. Um, so it's always going to be cheaper to come in, shoot the rhino, take them out and um, you know, and, uh, yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's, that's the thing that is, is uh, not always understood by people. They, they say, why can't we have an ivory trade? Why can't we have a rhino horn trade? Uh, in the case of ivory elephants, if we just you take the ivory from elephants that died by, from natural causes, wouldn't that be great? Because we can, um, we can use the money to fund conservation. The elephant is already gone. We haven't hurt anybody and it helps community. And theoretically, that would be great, but the uh, legal and law enforcement uh, structures needed to um, enforce uh, assist any kind of system that that would require across multiple countries. You know, these yeah. the, the, it's not even the same continent that is the demand uh, the, the demand side that is the supply side. So you need this hourglass shaped multi-country multinational effort to police and regulate. And, and no one puts the money into that. And no one, and history says, not only uh, are we as yet unable to put something like that in place, but everyone cheats uh, right off the bat and, and poachers aren't even in the class of cheaters. They're, they're the ones who are on the outside of that, so. Let, let me ask you a weird question. When I was in Chongqing, China, a woman, um, a medicinal herbal woman who kind of sold what she said was rhino horn by the gram told me that traditionally in Chinese medicine, it was not considered an aphrodisiac. And she doesn't know where that came from. Is that something that was kind of created by Western media and then the new money in Asia began uh, using that as a, a trendy fashionable substance? Or is it something that was actually part of Chinese medicine? It's just that in China, you hear something different from in, in the media, in the West. My understanding is that it, it began as a rumor in the West that, I mean, this is one of the things about crummy, weak American reporting generally when it comes to wildlife. It's, it's, so it's very um, sexy to say it's an aphrodisiac, right? And, yeah. and, we, and we generalize about Asian uses of uh, natural products constantly. And, and it's often, oh, this is an aphrodisiac. And that's, um, yeah. So my understanding is that it began as a Western reported story and got picked up and believed or 
uh, leveraged by entrepreneurs in Asia. And now uh, my understanding is a whole mix. I mean, much of dead animal consumption is status in addition to any um, TCM, uh, traditional Asian medicine type things. Um, but status is the main driver for, for most of the dead animal consumption. So, I mean, uh, in, in your book, one of your main protagonists is Tom Clay, a journalist. Why was it important for you to use the voice of a journalist? Of course, in fiction, you can say many truthful things that you can't say in nonfiction. But why was it important since the media can make the news and point us in a direction that distracts us or in a direction that conscientiousizes us? Why, why was it important for you to use a journalist as the character in the book, in, in the telling of the story that you wanted to tell? This is a uh, thriller, and I wanted a main character who was hero ultimately heroic, even if flawed. And for me, uh, in my lifetime, journalists have always been heroic to me, and and it's a reason I wanted to become a journalist. I I looked up to um, the, the history's best investigative journalists in this country, uh, and. And, and I'll tell you, early on, I wrote a, a book uh, 15 years ago with a journalist as a protagonist, and the publishing world said to me, we can't publish uh, a, a book with a thriller with a journalist as a protagonist because they don't have enough at stake. Could you give us somebody in law enforcement? Or could you give us, <laughs> right? And, and now, of course, we're being savaged around the world, mm -hmm. imprisoned, shot. Um, fake news has become a, a phrase that is known around the world, and we have an extraordinary amount at stake. So one objective was to to remind people that uh, true journalists are not uh, are heroic. They are at the front line of these issues. They are our First Amendment uh, in this country protects them. And this, the other reason to have a journalist is his job is to be inquisitive. And I wanted to take the story into areas that that uh, I didn't always know about, and certainly the reader wouldn't always know about. And Clay had to Tom Clay the, had to learn about. So those two were two were driving forces for me. I mean, in, in terms of investigation, you've used GPS uh, trackers, and you've inbuilt them into fake ivory horns and watched that supply chain. What can you tell us about? what you learned and what you taught the US uh, policymakers about that process, about trade-based financing? Well, I can say, so the way we, we came to do that project was, um, and this is a good lesson for journalists, aspiring journalists. Um, I had, we had done a major investigation for cover story for National Geographic uh, on the ivory trade. Elephants, 25,000 elephants at least a year were being killed and we did a documentary plus the article. And it had a huge impact. It was raised at the uh, White House level and around the world and, and things, some changes were implemented. Um, but uh, I was getting reports from colleagues in Central Africa that the, the poaching continued, uh, even though we were getting these reports of great changes. And mm -hmm. it was my error to think that uh, poaching, elephant poaching was hom homogenous across the continent. I mean, I was stupidly naive to think it was the same drivers. It was the same. It wasn't uh, government corruption and greed in that, that you saw in Kenya and Tanzania. It was a more violent uh, set of circumstances in Central Africa. And so once I realized there were really two different stories on the same species, um, we wanted to go after that. We wanted to, my first thought was that this is probably uh, a lie, that this is probably an effort by conservation NGOs to increase attention for elephants by saying terrorists like Joseph Coney are using the ivory. So I really set out to prove that they were um, misreporting or, you know, they were lying. Um, but I went on the ground into Garamba the, uh, in the Congo and some other places and it, people on the ground were saying we'd been attacked by the Lord's Resistance Army. They had taken ivory, they, they were moving ivory. This 
guy uh, was a, a recruit of Coney's who escaped and he said he was part of the team. And so there was enough to, to believe that there may be some truth to this. So we, but, but how to get that story? How do, you, how do you find out if that is really happening? And one of the things I think journalists, journalists in training, journalists should, if in the environmental space, there's an un, inappropriate reliance on experts, on secondary sources. And what we need are far more like you on the ground journalists who do actual reporting uh, of what's happening. But how to get into Sudan, where we were told Kony was likely to be in Darfur. It's very violent thing. So I did, um, uh, one of the techniques I use is to uh, regularly be on the lookout for a surrogate. Think of if we're having problems uh, investigating something, thinking about it in this case as ivory, what if we thought about it another way? So instead of thinking about it as ivory, what if we thought about it as cocaine, as the illicit good that was being trafficked and as elephants as cocaine? And when we did that, then we asked ourselves, okay, how would we maybe investigate cocaine trafficking? Well, if we, if we were law enforcement and we could get a GPS tracker inside a suitcase of cocaine, we'd be able to track that flow. Uh, and so I, um, at first I tried to put uh, trackers inside elephant tusks and we, I flew over to uh, the Congo. I got, I got uh, permission from the president's office um, to move ivory across borders, which is something that, you know, you have to take into consideration when you're dealing with a, uh, CITES Appendix 1 product, um, you know, you, even as an investigator, you can't move that product across national borders without violating law. So I, it was a little gray area, but I got permission from the appropriate government authorities and brought Dremels, uh, drill tools over to Africa and tried to drill out the, the cavity inside a tusk. And a tusk is a tooth. So it has a big root canal but they're very, very strong. And uh, I burned out multiple Dremels trying to drill out this cavity. So we came back and I had done a story on taxidermy in the United States. I knew one of the best taxidermists in America. And I went to him and I said, can you build me a tusk? And he said, sure, I build them all the time for my clients. I said, no, 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 a perfect tusk, one that will pass muster with people I'll tell you about later because I didn't want to tell them up front. And he said, sure, I think I can do that. And I'd have to, and I, I told him, you're gonna to need to put the Schrager lines in, which were the, uh, if, when you cut a tusk in half, just like when you cut a tree in half, there are rings. And I, I needed those to be on the tusk. He hand painted me these exquisite tusks. And then he shellacked them with the same material they use on NASCAR uh, race cars to, to, to make sure that they were um, protected. And before he was finished, his name is George Dante. I said, George, okay, I have something I need to tell you. Um, I'm going to put a tracker inside this. And so he had to go back and refigure. And I didn't take this into account because the tracker was going to be battery plus wires and antenna. And we wanted the antenna at the narrow end of the tusk and the battery, the biggest battery we could. So we wanted that at the base. Um, it was going to uh, require that he um, use ball bearings to counterweight the tusk, the, the electronics, so that the tusk weighed consistently throughout. And ivory, as a side note, is extraordinarily dense and really heavy. When you pick it up, you're su surprised. It's heavier than you think it's going to be. And so it was a big challenge to get this all weighted correctly and and we did not want to leave even a charging port. So this was each of these that we built was a one time only operation. Once we sealed it, that battery had to work or not. And we had, we weren't sure how long we were going to have um, for each tusk, but, but uh, we then took them over to Africa and worked on how to get them into uh, the black market.
And, and how did you get them into the black market? I mean, it's not just an incredible level of trust, but this is a massive investigation that has to then be entered into the black market in order to track it. So, I mean, how did you get the right contacts to vouch for you to take that story through to completion? So we mapped out a number of uh, different options. Um, one was to, you know, I didn't want to put anyone at risk because this, this is the sort of thing that is dangerous for anybody who gets involved. And, and one of the options was to leave them in a um, duffel bag kind of thing on a bus um, uh, in Dar, Dar, Dar Salaam uh, or down the coast uh, a little further. Um, another was to um, wreck a motorcycle in on a path that we thought was used by um, trafficking syndicates and just and leave the bag as if there'd been an accident and the, the rider um, fled. Um, so we explored, we, we looked at um, dropping them by uh, plane and glider into uh, areas where people were likely to pick them up innocently and move them with, with other tusks and get them into the black market. We looked at a, at a whole host of things and the actual way we did it um, because of the danger involved, um, uh, I still, um, I don't go into any more detail than that. Yep. Yeah. Well, that was an absolutely extraordinary story to read. Um, and, and it's interesting that you had to get clearance when we were looking at a pangolin scale trafficking story the traffickers from Cameroon and Nigeria told us to FedEx it because courier companies don't actually check. They said e-commerce law right. only looks at the Czech Republic. So they appear to be both masters of law evasion, <laughs> uh, especially where national law is locked in silos. So journalists and criminals appear to have much more flexibility than law enforcement, right? We can do things that they actually <laughs> can't because of the hygiene of evidence and being locked in national silos. But at the same time, they also advised us on how to set up uh, cryptocurrency wallets, $15,000 max at a time. They were so patient. They said, we're gonna help you set it up and you can pay us in this and that way. And they sent us all of their corporate documentations to say, listen, we've paid off a chain of people from customs to this, to police. So if anything happens, we've got it covered. And what was fascinating is how prepared they were and how concretized their system actually was. They want to give you confidence as a foreign buyer that they're not going to scam you. This isn't a 411 system. They're actually going to deliver on the goods. And they were willing to send us a parcel of pangolin scales, which they said had been freshly hacked. Don't worry, there's a big bush meat market. Nobody will be able to track this. So, you know, the consideration that these guys put into their work and almost the, the effort and, and the attention to detail is much more than law enforcement sometimes does in many countries where they only focus on the crime of killing. And you see a lot of the, the other units in law enforcement, especially in the financial sector or the organized crime sector, don't really connect with wildlife uh, trafficking police. Is, is there a, a rung in law enforcement that you've seen where wildlife trafficking is the absolute lowest and it's kind of isolated? Or, or is it just a, a deprioritization because they are much more serious issues and they haven't connected terrorism and human trafficking back to this uh, uh, network? Yeah, I would say, I would say it has always been true that the lowest rung of law enforcement is wildlife. And um, the big, I've talked to prosecutors for years in the United States and it's, you know, the old story, the, the old timers in the, uh, U.S. government talk about how they were ridiculed for saying, you know, we're going to put down this cocaine trafficking case to take on this um, sea turtle egg trafficking case. And um, it was only, and this is something that I've, I've, um, I've been a part of encouraging around the world, it was only when the uh, prosecutor office, uh, the U.S. Department of Justice, uh, created an environmental crime section and the state of Florida um, um, 
a prosecutor named Chris McAlilly down there also uh, worked to create a uh, environmental crimes section at the state level. Those two separate, separate prosecutorial efforts opened the door in the United States to prosecuting and, and really that, that, that single change, giving prosecutors sort of giving them a silo so that they could just go after wildlife crime changed everything in this country. And that's definitely one thing that could be empowering prosecu educating prosecutors and judges and then empowering them uh, either by regulation or administration around the world is something that, in my opinion, is one of the easiest, it's expensive, not, not in big terms. If we look at the cost of the pandemic, uh, these are very infinitesimal costs, but to empower prosecutors in a separate unit where they're not having to balance um, you know, an animal case against a human case um, would be a big step forward. Um, so, so you, you mentioned the pandemic and earlier you mentioned the, the farming of wildlife in ways that was never intended for it. Like it, con it actually changes the nature of that species, whether it's a lion farm in Polokwane or Hume's rhino um, farms. To what extent is the, the misuse and abuse of these animals by the elites, you know, not just in Hong Kong, but everywhere in the world to eat parts of animals like a tiger's penis or shark fin soup, um, or a special kind of snake, to what extent is that going to be an incubator of many, many pandemics to come? I mean, is this something that has been so deprioritized and overlooked that we don't really see the way in which it has integrally shaped political economies, um, the well-being of society, and so forth? Or, or is it something that, because I, I know virologists are looking at it, but it doesn't seem that the world has caught on to these species as hosts of the next zoonotic diseases. Yeah, it's extraordinary to me um, to stay on that for a second that, that we are in, we could have millions have died because of uh, what's, what the WHO uh, is suggesting, likely an, a wild animal based um, uh, traded animal or farmed animal or temporarily farmed animal um, housed, uh, housed, was the home to this um, virus. And, you know, I've been doing this nearly 20 years uh, some, involved in some form of the wildlife trade. And uh, many of us have been saying, look, if you allow um, trade in these species, if you allow um, destruction of these wildernesses, if you allow um, loggers and illegal loggers to go into these forests and, and, and drive roads into these woods, you're going to have more and more zoonotic uh, diseases. And um, it doesn't feel to me like anything has changed in the, certainly in the period of the pandemic. It doesn't I'm not in the, I haven't been in the field for a bit, but, but it, it, I do monitor kind of the general climate and it doesn't feel like anyone has, Picked this up. was the thing as a criminal investigator that I thought, well, that once if, if, if things really get bad, we will learn our lesson and really start protecting ecosystems as, as a form of self-preservation, selfishness. And a lot of what, what's the challenge as a writer and as a storyteller is to figure out a way to harness the audience's own self, own greed, selfish interest um, in a way that um, induces them to, to, to act in a way that protects other life. And I, it's, it's astounding to me that no, that, that no one has been able to uh, orchestrate Connect that turn for people. Yeah. 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 Um, and, and just speaking of that, you gave a talk a few years ago, just on not storytelling, but you were telling a story of how sometimes societies, um, especially communities who live within certain reserves or with exposure to certain rainforests and wildlife are often vilified, um, whereas in fact, they are the protectors of those areas. Do you feel that the conservation narrative is something that has been framed 
to purport a kind of staged authenticity, you know, where somebody comes in from abroad, they see a lion and a tiger and a Maasai man dressed up with his little spear, and he's an accessory to this tourist experience. Whereas in reality, the way in which that experience has been created as a conduit of capital is destroying the ecology. Is that something that you've come across, that this, there is a false narrative in conservation and that conservation narratives can pose a danger? And if so, what are the narratives that do pose a danger? Uh, um, there, it is definitely the case that, that colonialism runs, there is a sort of accepted base colonialist theme that runs through a lot of uh, American and Western storytelling when it comes to uh, particularly African uh, conservation. And most of the main players in the stories are white. Most of the main players are of European descent or Americans uh, overseas. And you have very, very few um, stories of empowered uh, Africans um, uh, telling their own stories. And, and there, we, we like these stories of see, where, we, where we get close in storytelling is to talk about militarized uh, anti-poaching units. And if they're all female anti-poaching units, even better. That's, that's, yeah. that, that, that's really appealing to, to storytelling. But, but what is really needed um, is to hand over all of this in a way, or figure out ways to empower um, storytelling, give the lead in storytelling and the lead in what this means to communities, to the journalists on the ground um, who grew up there. And we, we don't do enough of that at all. Um, and one thing I you know, will say to people, I, I get to speak with the very privileged people, very wealthy people who, I mean, some of the who have uh, not, their ulterior, they have ulterior motives that are not pleasant. I mean, they, they view, uh, there, are, there is a, certainly a thread in the conservation community that are very wealthy people who um, are, um, enjoy the fact that they can be part of police, basically police operations in Africa and justify it by uh, thinking about saving the elephants or lions or things that, and that is, um, you're moving into territory that is very familiar uh, to the violence that we're seeing on our streets here in the United yeah. States. Um, so yeah, there's a lot to be improved in the, in the narratives. And, and it seems as if that inequity, as you said, that's on the streets, that's in boardrooms, in the real world, reproduces itself into how the ecology is framed. And then at the same time, you see that everyday products on the shelf, for example, palm oil that's in toothpaste and Kit Kat, comes from these magnificent rainforests that is leased out to companies at $2 a hectare. And then, of course, that goes back to criminal capital that funds these so-called logging companies which then links into Asian banks and back to pension funds, right? Like uh, BlackRock. So you find Nurse Nancy's money is going into a pension fund that gives her returns, that's investing in an Asian bank, that's got criminal money from Sinar Mas that's then coming into Gabon and fucking the planet up, excuse my language. So to what extent do you feel that as journalists, as NGOs, as the media, we've missed the bigger picture? I mean, if you could correct the narrative as you've been doing, but if you could give it to us in bullet points, what? Have we not been focusing on? What do we need to focus on as humans, as journalists, and also as law enforcement? Because I'm, you know, as a financial researcher, I always see that there's a gap in how the financial model behind the environmental trade system is, is covered, as opposed to someone killed a pangolin, a magistrate let that fucker off for a hundred dollars, sorry for my language, cash fine, his passport was never logged, and that's that. So it seems the judicial system has failed. But as someone with 20 years of experience, and who's entered into the highest levels of political power, you know, you've briefed senators, you've changed laws. In bullet point, what do you think needs to be made public, needs to change at all of these different levels, civil society, journalists, and lawmakers? Uh, well, that's a tall order. I would, I would say the thing that is, that one thing that is on my mind a lot lately 
is um, the rise of autocracies. And uh, so you have a Duterte, you have Putin, you have uh, these, you have Trump, you have these uh, political figures who are, um, this, is what I, this is why I call the, the novel In the Company of Killers, because I wanted to get at things that, that, that are all around us and obvi they are obviously problems around us, but we can't connect them in a, in a direct narrative, uh, uh, certainly within the confines of a magazine article or a documentary. And um, the way these guys operate is to soften um, the eyes that are on them. So you use the term fake media, fake news. And that it, it's astounded me to hear fake news, the word, the phrase fake news in the Philippines, instant, uh, you know, seconds after Trump started using it and by autocrats around the world. And there you soften the, what the, the objective is to weaken the media, weaken the eyes that are on you. Um, you do a similar thing in the regulatory regime. And one of the things I think that is important for people to understand is the failure and the failing of these democracies around the world are linked to the um, devaluation of life in general. And, and that life includes wildlife. And so we by failing to be outraged by what's happening in the Philippines, by what's happening to journalists and opposition, political opposition, Navalny in Russia, by failing to engage on that, you are doing, a, if you're in the environmental space, you are, you're missing part of the picture and it's the big picture and it's outside your scope. It feels like it's outside your scope, but it's not. So that uh, may feel too big to most people feel too esoteric, but it is these things, you know, without, um, without, without a Rupert Murdoch hiring uh, Tucker Carlson to celebrate violence on the streets of America, uh, you don't get mercenaries going to protect Glencore mines in the DRC stripping that country for rare earth metals, going into Chinese cell, all our cell phones. And that is an ecosystem and it's out there um, and we miss that. So there are lots of smaller things. There are lots of things that we should be focusing on, but, but the thing that has me uh, quite upset uh, is, is that sort of scale. And, and in terms of ecological economists, um, they're currently in a process of trying to value, as we've seen with carbon trading, which of course allows a company like BP to sell their dirty energy to another company. They end up having a so-called clean state and, and that company ends up doing the same thing. So it, it, there seems to be a lot of theater and a lot of stagecraft and whitewashing, but what ecological economists are saying, you know, to give a financial value to mangrove swamps that would otherwise have no value. Do you see that as a slippery slope in a capitalist world where they can now value the fish as opposed to the ocean, the tree, as opposed to the forest? Is commodifying something with a financial price tag a massive, massive problem? I mean, do we need to be conscientized in a different way? Because I used to work with some of these guys and they are cold and abstract they don't really look at the heart of something and the right to life of that tree, of that river. So is there a different way that we need to look at the world that in a capitalist economy, you mentioned in South Africa, you know, the role of private property, that a lion can now be raised as a cat in a bucket. I mean, it doesn't even look like a lion anymore. It's deformed. So how do we need to, as a very compelling, empathetic person, how do we need to change the way that we look at the world? So there are people are get, people are getting very excited about commodifying and creating investment funds to to um, protect wildlife, and I haven't spent a lot of time looking at the intricacies of that, um, but I do know that um, you know that sort of framework is at its heart a pay to stay 
framework that is the same as Robert Mugabe's view on elephants. You either pay with your tusks or you're gone. And that pay to stay mentality is you pay, you, you produce value for our society, for humans, or you're yeah. gone. And to turn these, um, to turn co-species co co into instrumental ends for, for, for your enrichment and, and how you view an ecosystem, how you think an ecosystem should work today, you know, maybe different from uh, how you think of it tomorrow. Um, I'm drawn to a Sand County Almanac where, you, you know, the, the, that pivotal book in the thinking of Americans about nature and nature to be appreciated as life itself, as, as for the beauty, not for the beauty, because that's our view of it. It, it, it is a, it, 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 all of us are a, a candle flame. That's it. We are each a flame. And if I snuff that flame out, I have, because I have the power to do it, I did that. But, um, you know, to say this is more valuable than that, because it's valuable to me, um, to me, uh, is a slippery slope. Um, I don't know enough about it to, to be able to say, you know what, it is a slippery slope, but the benefits outweigh the cost. I don't know enough. I do know that not often enough do people say that's life dead st full stop and we should protect it or we should not harm it. Um, and, and just very quickly, Professor Poggi has a question. As a journalist who's been in many, many dangerous circumstances, what is the, the personal line that you have? Because danger is part of the overhead in the job. It's just part of what we do. But what is your personal line for a job? Because our boss, you know, at OCCRP, he often has to restrain us in terms of what we want to do to get the story. Um, you know, we'll set up shell companies and we'll go as far as we can go. But then there's a certain line that, you know, every journalist personally doesn't want to cross for their own security and safety. What is your line? Do you have a line? Have you ever crossed it? Did you know only after you crossed it? I don't have a, uh, I'm not trained as a journalist, so I don't, um, it turns out I learned a lot of rules uh, late. Uh, I didn't know the journalism um, establishment frowned on undercover work at all. I just didn't know that. I, I, I thought it, I thought that's what you were supposed to do. But, but well, your well, uncle was an FBI agent, right? <laughs> an undercover agent. <laughs> that too trained me, yes. Uh, so we, I mean, my framework was uh, a lawyer's perspective, which was do anything, do, stay within the law and get the facts. That, that, that's what has driven me. And I've since interacted with people who have um, a, a more refined view of what's, and you have to balance, you know, is the cost worth the, worth the compromise? And I understand that. But I also understand in reality, it's a very subjective process. And uh, I tend to err on getting the facts. Although the novel, in the novel, Tom Clay does the same thing. I have him bend a lot of rules. And one of the things that I enjoyed in the book was what happens to him. He thinks like I have from time to time in the past that I know better than anybody who's going to manage me um, what the Thing, right thing to do is and how to do it yeah. and clay is that sort of guy and clay screws up really royally and he doesn't know it until too late uh and i wanted to get at that because i'm not even when i thought i was right i was not right um uh in terms of the danger you know it's, it's kind of your gut thing and um you know i've never done what what your co our colleagues in Russia have had to do, where you're, where you're on the ground with people who will murder you and and have and be state sanctioned in murdering you. I haven't. I've as a Western reporter, I have the luxury of knowing I'm about to go home. When I talk to journalists in Africa, and you know, they have to stay, and I know, I know 
a couple of very big American crime stories that I have not told because I know that because of the danger that I know would I would encounter personally. And Afri people in Africa, uh, many of the countries I've been to uh, would face that any day of the week reporting the sorts of things that I report there, you know, freely. Yeah. Um, I, I think though the, the difference in Africa is that if you're a mediocre journalist or you're an extremely skilled journalist, they can still take you just because they want to take someone. You know, we've had cases where people were just taken because they were in front of people who were looking to make an example of the media. And in most countries, even a country like Botswana, which seems so tamed, it's like a coerced peace, one party rules. There's um, Cape Libel Act, there's Secrecy Act, even a distributor of a newspaper article can be jailed for up to 20 years. So there's all of these things hidden into the system. And as you said, they remain behind on the front line, whether or not they do anything. Um, okay, Professor Pokey has a question. I've been rambling too much. Not at all. This is absolutely fascinating. So thank you very much for this great discussion. I just wanted to ask you, uh, in the context of these animal farms uh, for creating the kinds of goods that people want to import. So basically, I mean, uh, not knowing very much about the, the trade in wildlife in particular, I imagine it to be somewhat similar to what we have in the United States with the war on drugs, that so long as there is a profound demand for drugs, there will always be ways in which the drugs flow in and there will always be criminal enterprises that will uh, make a profit on it. And so uh, you might say that one strategy that could help here is to fulfill the demand in some other way. And when you describe that, these farms where uh, rhinos are kept like cattle, of course that is uh, heartbreaking in a way, but it's also uh, something that may produce the thought that maybe we are too anthropocentric about this. You know, we sort of think of this is how we know rhinos from our stories and from the way they lived when they had a lot of space, but maybe for the rhinos, uh, they can have a reasonably happy existence under different life circumstances, much like human beings have learned to live in apartment buildings when before they were roaming in uh, large savannas and forests and so on. So my question is first, uh, is there any evidence that this is really bad for animals or depressing for animals to live in such uh, cramped quarters? And secondly, uh, what do you think about this diagnosis that ultimately the demand will find a way to get satisfied uh, and criminals will profit and will find ways to satisfy that demand one way or the other. And so it's in a way better to bring it out into the open, make it legal, satisfy the demand in some other way and thereby undercut the economic incentives to go out and hunt down wild animals. Right, well, this the second question in particular is the driving question um, be, or the, the driving inquiry behind the argument we should legalize. And in history tells us that um, despite the economic um, theory that the implementation, the practical implementation has proved uh, impossible. And in fact, when we, there was an experiment with elephants for a period where they legalized the uh, ivory trade, they allowed a series of one-off sales of, of ivory from Southern African countries to China. And uh, subsequent to that, um, uh, the poaching skyrocketed. And it skyrocketed because um, everyone believed, okay, it's, go it's going to, open, wide open, let's take everything we can. And they killed as much as they could. And um, the uh, sellers in China similarly were, they'd prefer to buy a poached, or a poached elephant can be cheaper than, a, um, than one that came through from, an, from the auction. Um, so 
what's happened to the wildlife trade is there's so little funding for, for the rangers, for, for wildlife departments, for the sort of monitoring that would be required to do a systematic um, farming, uh, because it's not just the farms you need to protect. If you create farms, you need to protect the wild animals because that parallel, the, you know, the farmed animals are expensive and I don't have the money for to start a rhino horn farm, but I do have the money to shoot that one that's in the bush uh, down the road. And, and so you have, and that's what, as a reality, that's what happened. As to um, the well-being of the animals, I think, you know, it's, um, uh, there are two ways for, my mind goes to two, in two different directions. One, um, probably it is certainly better than being shot. <clears throat> Uh, it, it is to live like a like a, a cow, um, uh, even though the process for the rhino when they're raised like a cow is every couple of years to be hunted like a wild animal and then shot with a dart, and then they saw the new horn, the horn grows back, so they saw the new horn off, but they still go through the trauma of being shot and 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 all of that life. So every few years it's. Now, again, they're, they're not homo sapiens, they're, uh, so it's a more primitive system, but they do live in fear of being shot every couple of years. Uh, but, but separate from that is the notion of e functioning ecosystems. And when you take, it is, it is you can't, um, we shouldn't think of farm salmon the same as wild salmon. We shouldn't think of um, farmed rhino is they're out they're taken once they're taken outside of the ecosystem they're biologically dead to to the well-being of that system so that's the sort of second arm of that that issue of, of whether to raise animals and and try to um, farm them how are we everybody's frozen Yeah, that, that was, uh, and, and also when you see these animals, you see that, as you've said, they're living in ways that they were never intended to live, so they cease being what they actually are. So the, the idea of having an animal raised and then culled in ways that satisfy human concerns that are not mandatory for human well-being is also something that just teaches us how selfish we have become as a species to think that everything must serve us instead of us being a part of the world. It's frustrating. I think Professor Pogi is now shutting down his rhino horn farm. <laughs> He's probably on the internet <laughs> shutting <laughs> his down. <laughs> um, so just a quick question. In some of your investigations, have you, I mean, you've mentioned before that governments are undermined by the, the illicit and illegal trafficking of things, but at the same time, have you seen regimes that repurpose themselves to allow for this to happen within their, their sovereign uh, politic body? For example, in Gambia, we could see um, that Casamance, a rainforest in nearby Senegal, was being raised down for rosewood, and the militia were being armed, and the Gambian ports were being repurposed to safely and in a technically legal way export this rosewood timber. Similarly, in Madagascar, you know, we saw that the presidential um, uh, candidates were all being funded by Rosewood um, and that the region was seen as now being economically productive, even though the source of that productivity was something that would ultimately not only ruin the ecology, but people's lives. So do you see that a lot, the political regimes being financed by uh, illicit activity and being repurposed to protect those cartels? Is it something that starts with the cartels or with the regimes or with both? Well, you, I think you saw something like that in Namibia uh, recently, right? With, for um, the exploitation of the fishing rights um, where, where that natural resource is used to finance um, um, a, a political candidate. Yeah. Um, yeah, the president sent us a message in the middle of Easter weekend on a Saturday night saying we were all in cahoots. 
<laughs> with each other. His public message was that these people are in cahoots with locals. And I thought, I haven't seen the word cahoots since the 1980s. <laughs> uh, yes. Well, and he's right. I mean, that's the answer, right? I, we are all in cahoots and, and in wanting uh, an answer to, to how you think that is correct, you know, something you're, you're, you should be allowed to do. Um, yeah, I mean, there, there are, depending on, it's, it obviously varies by government, government by government and uh, resource by resource. Uh, Rosewood is, and timber is a huge, and, you know, I'm often asked what, what wildlife trade do we miss? Do we not focus on enough? And timber uh, is one. And I had people even pretty seasoned people say, well, no, I, I said wildlife trade. And it, and one of the things we need to do as journalists is, is realize that timber uh, is part of the wildlife trade um, uh, and is also habitat to um, wildlife. So if you pull the habitat away, all of those species perish. Um, and as just as a side note, the timber trade is the most violent trade that I've um, encountered. The, and, and so we, we ought to pay more attention when we are ordering our pool furniture um, and building our homes, um, where that wood came from, and um, and and you know because the western uh, timber taken from Western Africa or Brazil that ends up in in the project that I did goes through Vietnam and then comes back to the United States. That is one of the most violent pathways uh, for 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 investigators, for, for, for competitors. Um, and we ought to pay more attention to that. And the timber trade is what, you know, it's taking down the trees that, that lead to human species that are not meant to interact, interacting. And you get the zoonotic jumps um, and spillovers that, you know, my friend David Kwaman writes so well about. Uh, it's all connected. Yeah, and, and just one final question before, I'm sorry we've ranted so much. Uh, you were previously trying to help OCCRP with, with a story where we were looking at ivory being smuggled inside timber from the DRC to Asia, and you'd put us in contact with a few uh, critical people. We found that the lack of investigative journalists that we could work with in Vietnam and in certain Asian countries presented a massive problem. So. In, in your experience, what are the countries that have, I mean, you wouldn't expect it because some African countries are so dangerous, but there was just a complete lack of journalists that could do this investigative undercover work in Vietnam and we just couldn't move forward on that front. In your experience, what are the countries globally that, or rather where press freedom or lack of press freedom has allowed for a more criminal uh, political economy to flourish? Oh, well, it's it, it, let me put it this way, every country where there is large scale criminal activity, you will find a suppressed meet, suppressed press. Um, pick, your, pick your country where, you know, run by, um, whether in Putin's case, run by a criminal um, or in the case of well, you can you can define your criminal differently as you move across the globe, but um, you know, I'm very sad to. That's my experience too in Vietnam. Um, it was very difficult to find uh, a journalist on the ground. It underscores that, and this may be a project that Yale could undertake or the Pointer Group could undertake. Is certainly it was something that I was really enjoyed doing with National Geographic. Uh, we began training. Um, I, I did some training in Africa, uh, East Africa and Central Africa, but, but creating training programs for, for journalists would be wonderful. Um, and I, if, if you had any interest, I would in a second uh, participate. That's excellent. Um, and in, in terms of security tools that you use or that you provide when you're training people with, what are the, the the basic uh, systems that you use, for example, Signal, PGP, what are some of the five core things that you, that you absolutely cannot do without? 
Well, so it's only been five years since I was last in the field and the dangers to jur investigative journalists are, have skyrocketed. I, I feel like five years ago was the close to the golden age of investiga international investigative journalists. In, since that time, I helped somebody uh, on a project in China and her phone was cloned instantly. Um, she she uh, was in her hotel room and uh, without the phone ringing, um, the, uh, an image of someone appeared uh, from her hotel that she recognized as a person in her hotel lobby reading that day's paper as a warning. Um, the facial recognition technology and things that you have to go through at checkpoint at, at every in China would prevent me today, even five years later, from doing some of the things um, that I did. Obviously, Signal is a very useful um, technology. I I err. I'm most interested in the human side of things. I'm not. I, I I don't think of myself as a reporter so much as a journalist. So I'm I'm really interested in human, the, the interacting for long periods of time with individuals. So my security concerns are lower. I very rarely am, am actually undercover. I'm, I just very slowly build up a trust relationship with people I want to interview. And I tell them I'm a journalist. And I, it's astounding what people will tell you. <laughs> I, I mean, uh, even knowing that you're a journalist, if you've spent the time to build a relationship with them. And that's the most valuable, the word undercover gets thrown around a lot, but really I do almost none of it. it but it feels like undercover because you've spent so much time. Um, uh, but, but organizations like GIJN, um, Global Investigative Journalism Network has great tools, as you know, um, OCCRP, um, you know, um, pointer, um, um, they have great tools and great um, online programs that I've watched and, and uh, learned from. Do you, I mean, in, in terms of males and females, this is a weird question, but uh, in the battle between persuasion and deception and as concerns investigation, do you see that one gender might be more intuitive than the other, or is, does it really depend on the person? I have no basis to... to... <laughs> I just thought I'd ask. <laughs> okay, Enzo has a question. Hi, Mr. Christie. Thank you so much for your time today and just you know, for answering these wonderful questions. Um, mine is along the line of the economic side of things. We know that illicit trade basically creates its own demand as you know as people start using it, even if you um, basically try to limit how much of it there is, you know the price might go up, but there'll still be people out there to buy whatever this product is. So with regards to you know consumers of um, wildlife that's smuggled, what are some of your suggestions you know, that we can do as a society? You know, we're not law enforcement, we're not the government. What can we do to combat this? You know, this basically it's, it's an atrocity. What can we do to fight this? As, and in what role you mean as an individual? Yes, as, as individuals, you know, as members of um, a global community, I would say, and myself as a student, what can we do to fight this? Yeah, I, you know, the, one of the most important things to do is if you find stories that express uh, the problem well, is to share those stories. I mean, people really operate in silos. You'll meet, we, I had this experience recently where some friends were very excited about going to Thailand and riding the elephants there and how great that was for the, for conservation. I said, do you have any idea how, violent the training of those elephants is and in fact i have to correct myself i didn't say that it took me because they were a close friend it was hard for me to, and they were so excited it was hard for me to say that but it needed to be said and it took me a while to express that so you're going to run into 
or you may run into difficult situations like that. Um, uh, but have the, for me, I, I think about the wildlife, you know, I just think about these voiceless life candle flames that, that could use your spreading the word. So it, it doesn't sound like a very big thing, but um, there isn't enough of it. Excellent. And Maggie Pebworth has a question as well. Her hand is. Hi. Um, um, sorry, I'm blanking uh, suddenly. Uh, my question was, um, how is, as someone who, you mentioned this earlier, uh, you, you never trained really as a journalist, you have a, a legal background. Um, how have you, how do you feel like that is sort of, um, change your approach somewhat, like you talked about being undercover um, versus not. Um, I was just wondering if you could talk about that. I, th I think what, um, I don't know what I don't know. So I don't know what I would have learned uh, in, journal in a journalism program. I, I do know that um, the approach I've taken, uh, the way in which law has influenced the way I approach stories is that I have from the very beginning only wanted to do stories where I can make a difference. And I have wanted to prosecute the subjects that I choose. And, and so what does that mean? So as a lawyer, I say to myself, who, who's the criminal in this case? Who is the victim? What laws are, have enabled this activity um, or, or not? Um, what government official is uh, um, complacent or complicit in this? effort, uh, who is the consumer and are they a knowing consumer with respect to the illegality? And I put all of that in my stories and I call it results-oriented reporting. Reporting stories in a way that if somebody reads one of my stories, they can like it or not, but they will never be able to say, I didn't know. I didn't know that was a problem. I didn't know who was doing it or what is needed to, be, to fix it. And it takes a lot of words in a single story to be able to do that. But one of the things I would advise journalists moving forward, we have multiple platforms, expanding number of platforms, social media platforms, in addition to the few magazines that are left around and newspapers. Um, and, and part of what's important is to not only tell a story, but to keep telling it and to break it into smaller pieces and keep working each one of those over time because it, these, the notion that there's a one-off, a silver bullet that can take down uh, anything is, is wrong. And, and nor can you fix it, uh, which is something um, that I think a lot of journalists get wrong. They, they go into particularly the wildlife space and think, oh, how do I fix this? Your job is not to fix it. Your job is to expose it and count on the ecosystem of law enforcement federal state prosecutors, judges, politicians, school children to take up that mantle. And, and they, it's astounding if you give them the tools, what they can do as a system. That's true. I mean, I, I also didn't study journalism. Many of my colleagues didn't. And our boss hates us just the same. So, <laughs> <laughs> so you, you basically learn by doing. It's the same with law school. Yeah, I, I did a master's in law. And you learn nothing in school. You only learn by actually... <laughs> learning on the job and getting smacked around and someone threatening to fire you. Uh, there's a great question in the chat box. I was wondering how oppressive regimes limit your ability to publish your findings uh, and those of local journalists in the countries where the criminal activity mainly takes place. So a brilliant question because in many African countries, there is no whistleblowing uh, protection. There's no media protection. Civil society has no protection. Um, but at the same time, you know, I'm just wondering in the US, there's also a kind of censorship in terms of what stories have currency and can be pushed and where editors will say there just isn't enough of an audience for this. Yeah, it's very, that you pushed a few buttons for me. Um, for, for journalists on the ground and oppressive regimes, it's, I don't know how they do it. They, it's, it's extraordinary. I know talking to some of the, cutting edge um, investigators in Russia, that one technique they do to stay just this side of 
uh, violent retaliation is to, to never say anything personally about the criminal they're reporting on. So they can talk about what he or she did in detail, but you can't, you, you can't make personal comments about that uh, individual or you have stepped over a line and um, you could lose your life, right? Um, I think, you know, it suggests, I haven't given it a lot of thought, but it suggests, well, and GIJN may be the, the A framework for doing this, but uh, collaboration with um, local journalists operating on the ground, but, but publishing elsewhere. And absolutely, we need, um, we need the support of bigger, well-financed institutions to, to put that sort of thing out there. I created at National Geographic something uh, called Wildlife Watch. It's an independent platform um, to be able to deliver um, sometimes smaller um, stories, stories that uh, might not make it into the magazine, but to give greater regularity and a voice to more individuals. Uh, and that's one platform that, that people can reach out to in the, certainly in the wildlife space that, that is publishing stuff that, um, you know, is, is um, a way of, yeah. of getting these stories out. Yeah, there's the, the eJolt, the EU's eJolt database um, has a, a brilliant environmental conflict mapping. The problem is sometimes where things need to be updated and they aren't. So there's al also that tiny little thing. I, I'm sure um, your system uh, is updated, but that's always one thing I tell journalists to look out for. How is the API configured? How are things updated? Is it still relevant? Who's feeding the information and why? Um, mm. Professor Pogi has a final question. He spent a lot of time shutting down his rhino horn farm after you gave those damaging comments. And now he's back <laughs> with a question. <laughs> well, my big hope is that when I give up my rhino farm, you will call me Thomas, but we'll see. So here's my question. I was intrigued by your comments about the fixing versus uh, sort of reporting, highlighting the problem versus the fixing. And of course, you are a person with great passion. You care about these issues and you want, them, you want to see them fixed. So uh, in your choice of what you write about and where you focus your energies, obviously you are guided uh, by where you see problems and what you think are moral defects and maybe also by your assessment of what can be fixed, where so you're not exactly blind to the consequences of your work. And so what I'm trying to get at is how do you uh, trade these things off against each other? So for example, when you write, you will have ideas about what might happen as a consequence of what you write. And sometimes these consequences are good consequences and desirable consequences, but other times it might be that the truth that you expose may actually make matters worse in some way. So in the most obvious case, it might endanger certain people who are uh, fighting for what you see as the good cause. But it might also be that uh, people who are the lesser evil at some point get exposed. And so people who are even worse are indirectly benefited by your exposing malfeasance on the part of those who are maybe the lesser evil, let's say in a situation of two rival parties competing for political power in a particular country or something like that. So how do you resolve this in your own mind? Do you uh, sort of think about the consequences and say, I will try to be careful and try to uh, do the kind of journalistic work that I predict will have the best uh, achievable consequences, or do you more take the attitude, I'm here to report the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, may the consequences be what they may. Mm. Uh, so I can, <clears throat> I can answer um, part of your question uh, very uh, easily. Um, 
And that is, how do I choose the story? Um, and what I found was that not all, in the wildlife space, not all species are alike. That um, we have species that are more charismatic, that people love more than others. And so I made a short list of about 10 species. And it's because I started, my first investigation was of a reptile trafficker. And I discovered that while we made change, we got him arrested or he got arrested as a result and went to prison and they changed the laws in Malaysia and some other things. Um, the impact of that story didn't extend outside of the reptile universe. Um, I heard a interview with the actor Will Smith, um, who had just been declared the highest paid actor in America. And they said, how did you do it? How did you? And he said, well, I sat down with my agent and I took the last 10 years of highest grossing films and looked at that list and they were all science fiction. So I decided that's what we're doing. We're doing science fiction. And I, I, he did Men in Black and Men in Black 2 and was quickly uh, the highest paid actor in Hollywood. I asked myself, what's the highest paid species in the world? Not financially, but which ones are the most charismatic or which ones do people care about with the idea that if they care the most about them, we'll have the most impact. And that list broke, was elephants, uh, rhino, tigers, bears, and it, it, there's, you can, um, dolphin, uh, whales. It's, it's a pretty set list. And it's a list that NGOs, frankly, use to, to um, to uh, arrange their fundraising efforts. They also know which ones get the most, pull the most heartstrings. And I said, okay, I'm gonna start with what I think is the number one species, and that was elephants. But the idea that like uh, conservationists talk about umbrella species, a single species that can have a large impact on an ecosystem, that if I take elephants, I can have a huge impact on many species and we can get broad environmental laws changed. And so that's what I did. And I felt that that was worth the effort. And it, from my perspective, it was successful. We, we got a lot of things changed. Um, um, the, the narrower question, um, it, and it does start to funnel down as you, as you have to make choices. And is this story worth it? Is someone going to get hurt by um, and, and particularly with my style of thing where you're building relationships with people. Some of those people are criminals, but charming. Uh, some of them are uh, criminals, but relatively innocent. It's just their culture to, to move this material, this ivory or something. Um, it, it, it can be a very difficult choice. Um, I err on the side of truth be damned, but one reason I um, was comfortable moving to fiction was that you develop a sort of Stockholm syndrome, spending extended amount of time among criminal culture, where you befriend your friends, and, uh, and it's harder and harder to report what you know they're doing, or to look into what you think they're doing. And, you're and so you're looking in other worlds to get stories that you're not connected to but actually the thing you know the most about is right next to you and you're not telling that story. And uh, one reason I wanted to go to fiction was so that I could keep telling those stories and, and not have to wrestle as much with, um, with something I found really difficult to wrestle with. Yeah, and, and your writing is extraordinary. It is, um, as one famous writer described, clear as a pane of glass. Um, if anybody has any final questions, uh, we could ask them now. Otherwise, thank you, Brian Christie. Oh, there is a final question. I, so I'm going to take the thank yous back. Um, <laughs> uh, I, thought, I thought the remarks you made uh, on the possible connection of wildlife to the LR is very intriguing. Can you elaborate a little bit on the bigger picture? And also, Brian, I wanted to say that this top 10 list um, is also what Persian mothers do to their daughters. 
you know, they try to value the ones with the most currency. So it's a common formula used to value. <laughs> I do have, um, I do, I can't speak to that either. Uh, I do have a, a list of um, kind of tricks of the trade that I've put together for GIGN. Right. And I don't know if you have a forum, but I, I'd be happy to, it's, it's how I prioritize stories and how I shape and frame them. And I'd be happy to um, share them with, with um, that will be your very, students. Very, very helpful. So just let me know. Um, uh, as to the LRA, sadly, the LRA continues to operate. Uh, the, uh, the Trump administration pulled out support for um, the efforts to track Coney. And, and it's really, uh, from, uh, you know, you, it, it seems that he can't, he can't possibly still be it's sort of a bogeyman kind of scenario. He can't possibly still be operating and yet credible uh, entities are talking about raids on their villages and what happens is, is just horrible. Um, and the connection to wildlife was there enough for us to do the um, ivory trafficking project, the tusk that um, the tusks that we got into the black market moved the exact same path that um, the um, defector told us was how he carried uh, along the Central African Republic border with Congo and up into Sudan. And, and those tusks ended up in a town called Ed Dain in Sudan. And subsequent to that story, uh, investigators identified that as a result of that story and identified that town as a trafficking spot. Um, so it was a successful project, but not enough uh, is being done to address um, the LRA. And, and I think it's interesting because you mentioned how the LRA traded ivory for arms. And we know that arms trading is largely a private affair unless the country is sanctioned um, or there's an embargo. There's nothing stopping one country, for example, Russia, the Ukraine or Saudi Arabia from trading massive arms to a country that borders an African country. And from there, it can just be taken across the border. So aside from the end use certificate, there's literally nothing from stopping the arming up of many, many wars uh, and conflicts all over the world, which then allows ivory and rhino and pangolin scales to be used as a currency. Um, OK, I think there are no more questions. And we've taken up so much of your time. Thank you so much for the brilliant responses and for the knowledge that you've imparted um, and for helping Professor Pogi shut down his, not <laughs> illegal, but <laughs> it's a very interesting operation. Uh, and I think we'll leave it there if the professor has uh, no more questions. Well, Khadija, thank you. And thank you, Professor Pogi, as well. Uh, I very much appreciate the, the chance to be here. And, and I finally got into Yale. I, I'm, I'm, I'm always going to tell people I was, <clears throat> I was at Yale for a time. Anytime. Come back. Anytime. <laughs> We're happy to help you, but you'll have to call me Thomas. Uh, fair enough. Thomas, thank you. <laughs>